We're talking today with Magnus Energy Technologies. If you don't know the company, the ASX code is MNS, and it has a market cap of around 180 million. Magnus is a vertically integrated lithium iron battery technology and materials company with strategic assets in investments and partnerships in the electrification supply chain. The company's US-based subsidiary, IM3U New York, operates a gigawatt scale lithium iron battery man manufacturing project in Endicott, New York. We welcome back Hoshi Darawala, who is the company's US-based managing director. Welcome, Hoshi. Hi, Paul. How are you? I trust you're well. Very well indeed, my friend. Very well indeed. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I hear Sydney is really cold. Well, the US, we are in the middle of 35 degrees centigrade here. Uh, couldn't, couldn't be more evidence for the need of renewable energy and energy storage. Uh, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. It's been very cold these last few days. A bit of a polar blast over uh, Australia. So we're very jealous of your warm weather. Okay, so I've got a few questions uh, today, uh, Hoshi. You know, it's been a month or so since we last called up. Uh, so let's start by maybe give, uh, give us an update on what's been happening at Magnus since we you know, last spoke about a month ago. Sure, sure. So Paul, yes, it has been a month with the speed of things that moving here. It seems like it's been a long time since we last spoke, but I, I looked up my notes too, and yes, it was June 20th. Uh, today, I've taken the liberty of uh, inviting to this call two of our team members who we, we, we have an internal team called the Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC Committee, and Dr. Mike Osborne and Mr. Wade Quindy. Uh, you'll hear from them as they introduce themselves shortly. You know, it's inspiring when we have our internal meetings uh, between Dr. Ma Mike, Wade, and the attendees, at most times we are close to, if not more than 100 years of a lithium ion battery real world manufacturing experience in that particular meeting. So uh, given that Dr. Mike and, Mike and Wade, can you quickly and briefly introduce yourselves, please? Uh, yes, so thank you, Hoshi. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my background in the battery world is in lithium uh, manganese spinel, where I was, I was worked in the technical side and the commercial uh, commercialization of uh, those cathode materials. Uh, my broader background is in research and development, technical support for production and sales, uh, consulting and executive management. I've been uh, working at this for over 50 years. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Wade? Thank you, Hoshi. Hi, Paul, and um, thank you for having us. Uh, I started my career in the battery business uh, 31 years ago. We were the pioneers of producing lithium ion batteries. And uh, prior to that, I've worked in electronic defense. In the battery industry, I held uh, executive positions in operations and in uh, technology um, over 31 years now. Scaled up several, several battery technologies. So my expertise really in is scale up and commercialization. Thank you. Well, I've got some, uh, I've got some, obviously some, some questions. Um, yeah, in our last interview, uh, you, know, you talked, Hoshi, in depth about uh, IM3 New York battery plant receiving UN 38.3 certification. A question that's been widely debated across social media channels post that news is why the test seven was not required. Can you talk about this? Well, Paul, if it's on social media, it's got to be true. <laughs> so so uh, let's, let's more seriously, the UN 38.3 test for the production samples we last spoke about uh, has been reported as complete. We have the official certification from the testing authority. Uh, everything's fine. I, I can appreciate the question around T7 because it's, it's a technical question. Uh, Wade, would you like to take that question? Sure. Uh, T7, it's an overcharge, which for a secondary battery, we all know that. Uh, our product is not sold as an individual cell. If you were selling an individual cell used by itself, then you require an overcharge circuitry protection. But since it's part of a system, a module, there is no requirement for that test for individual cells. For example, the Apple battery, it's a single cell, but it operates a device. Our cells, it's part of a system. The entire system would require, but not the single cell. Thank you, Wade. Uh, Paul, Paul if, Wade, if Wade and Dr. Mike are giving you those comments, let me tell you, they're very humble, but some of the experience here goes back very deep and very long. And I would, I would treat that as uh, credible also. 
you know, the testing has been done at an entity that is 140 years in testing. Of course, not 140 years for all lithium ion batteries. And they're a global company. They are the, we, we test to what we're being asked to test to. Uh, we don't specify what we want to test to. So that's, that's how it is. Now, I hear loud and clear. Thanks, guys. And uh, let's move on. Uh, can you give us an update on uh, what is currently happening at IM3 New York and the particular the Anode Active Material Project? And let's talk around the plan on, on, on bringing production forwards and the pathway to uh, revenue. Sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Mike, can you take that? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll address the IM3 NY uh, production process. They're moving along the traditional path of having to go from a low rate uh, commercial production sample uh, rate to a targeted high rate commercial production rate. So uh, you have to make those samples first for your customers to validate you know, your, uh, the sales. And that's where we're at. And uh, uh, Hoshi, the graphite price has fallen significantly this year. What do you see as the key drivers of this weakness and how is the price weakness affecting anode pricing? Oh, Paul, you're, sending, you're, you're throwing me a curveball. You know, prices of, prices, of, uh, prices of commodities and materials fluctuate all the time, Paul, and various reasons for that. Uh, frankly, the pricing does what it does and sometimes you know, it's, it's things in our control, sometimes it's, it's macroeconomic and all these you know, geopolitical issues. Uh, how is China coming along? How is Korea coming? All of that stuff. What we do have control over is five fundamental things that uh, would make or break any, any cell manufacturing, graphite, or such kind of high businesses. That is what I call as technology, oper operations, manufacturing, and supply chain as number two. Number three is sales agreement. Number four is funding. Number five is experienced human resources. So let's talk through a little bit about each of them. Technology, as you know, has to be suitable for high volume production. It has to make product the right way at high volume at the correct yield. We, talk, we touched on that last time. Operations, supply chain, manufacturing, you know the key Magnus value driver is the vertically integrated supply chain. Having a high density, high purity, easy to mine and process graphite, which then flows into a large format cell manufacturing, uh, such as IM3, is a significant graphite synergy. No, no company in the world has that. Uh, sales agreements, I think we've covered that in past discussions. Uh, if, if we have, you know, if we need to discuss more, we can. Funding is a critical area. I think it's common knowledge now. We've put it out there. Uh, IM3 is working through the application for the 700 million in US DOE financing. Uh, as you know, next year is election year. So we anticipate a lot of movement around things. Uh, you know, IM3 is in a very unique spot. Uh, as you know, it's taken the old, uh, IBM facility, which is being repurposed for IM3 battery manufacturing. There's not that many US homegrown battery uh, entities, cell manufacturing entities. So I don't, I don't want to uh, say things that are not in my control, but I would, I would suspect if you join the dots, that 700 million in US DOE financing uh, looks pretty good based on the feedback that we have received. Uh, it's a matter of time when our application comes up and all the due diligence is completed, which goes through the process. And we, we really don't want to touch that. That's something that the U.S. government does. And all we can do is support with the questions. The last one, number five, you know, the critical area which folks on this call, Wade, Dr. Mike, I mean, these are areas where now the phase that we are in, we are going to high volume manufacturing uh, we need experienced technical team members, and a couple of those are on today's call. So we believe we've covered the five critical areas of what is required to be in the cell manufacturing and graphite business fairly well. Uh, and that's what we have control over. You know, once you have the right team, Paul, uh, if our pricing agreements are not exactly uh, how we need them to be, those are some of the things that we are working through and, and adjusting them, making sure that we, we get the results that we want out of these agreements. Good, and just a quick, quick uh, question there, Hoshi, with regards to the application for the, that, uh, that DOE uh, 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 loan, we know it takes, obviously, uh, it, it takes time to, to come to fruition. Can you just remind us, when you first put that application in, and is there any precedents, other, other uh, loans that have been given on, on a, a sort of time frame? Is it six, nine, 12 months? Is there any evidence out there to just, just give investors a better mm -hmm. idea? Sure, sure, Paul, thank you for that question, and again, uh, you're asking a question which we don't have control over, but I can give you indicators of what we know. Uh, it takes about six 
months plus uh, for a due diligence review from when the due diligence is initiated. Uh, we are being informed that we are going to due diligence fairly soon. Uh, and so the timeline of that, now that's that's a normal year, right? I mean, being an election year next year, uh, it may be shorter, it may be longer. Uh, but we, we are anticipating in the next uh, couple of quarters, uh, this should move along to a point where we are at a point where the 700 million is uh, gone through the process. We have that. And then uh, we're at the point where we bring in the right uh, equity partners uh, in support of the 700 million, because it's a match financing. You have to match that with the funds that you raise. Now, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with all of you to, today. Uh, and again, many thanks for, uh, for taking the time. As I said last time, clearly a lot going on at Magnus. And look, we really look forward to speaking with uh, all of you again in the, uh, in, in the near future. So thanks, gentlemen, and uh, the best of luck for the next few months. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for the opportunity. And as always, thanks to our Magnus shareholders. Uh, we really appreciate that, and uh, you're top of mind. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.